anyone looking down at the Earth would see a planet that is only one-third land, the rest is water. They'd see billions of creatures populating the land, but hidden from view is life under the sea. We know more about the moon than we do about what's to be found miles below the surface of the great oceans. When we talk of alien life, our eyes move to the stars. Considering our ignorance of the deep, perhaps that is where we should be looking. Cornwall has long been associated with myth and mystery. With a coastline stretching over 250 miles, many of the stories are inevitably linked to the sea. Sailors the world over have spoken of giant sea serpents, and Cornwall is no exception. In 1876, the West Britain newspaper reported that fishermen from Falmouth had found a huge sea snake coiled around their lobster pots, but had thrown it back into the sea. In the course of her researches into local history, writer Sheila Bird has come across many tales of strange sea beasts. There have been sightings around these shores for hundreds of years, and a lot in this century, particularly in the first decade of the century when the early steamships were around, and some of them were seen from the decks of the early steamships. Sightings of a mysterious marine animal known locally as Morgwa, Cornish for sea monster, continue to be reported along the coast. The village of Helford Passage lies on the banks of the Helford River, a few miles south of Falmouth. In 1979, Carrie Ham moved into one of the old Coast Guard's cottages. Early one June morning, she noticed something strange out in the bay. I looked out of the window and I saw what I thought was a yacht on its back. I thought, oh my goodness, I wonder if there's anybody on board. I looked again and it sank. Then it suddenly up came this thing like a big arm, shaking something at the end of it. Down, gone. But after that, I became very interested and every time I saw an article, or even a cutting about it, I kept it and I've got a scrapbook and it's filled with all the, the accounts. In March 1976, a woman calling herself Mary F. wrote to the Falmouth Packet newspaper claiming she had seen Morgwa. As evidence, she sent photographs. They were controversial. Many people suspected a hoax. But witnesses continued to come forward. One of them was Tony Doc Shields, a local artist. He claimed that it was here at Parsons Beach that one November day he saw Morgwa. The thing was there, a small head that rose up on a long neck and then one hump behind it, two humps behind it, and the third hump came up and it moved very smoothly along the river here and then turned and went out towards the bay and drop down. Doc says he took these photographs, but without a telephoto lens, they lacked detail. His story, too, was met with skepticism. People accused me of inventing it, except that a lot of other people were seeing it as well. I know what I've seen, and it doesn't matter whether they believe me or not. The great thing about it was that the thing exists. That is the mighty thing about it, that Morga is real. The credibility of other witnesses like Sheila Bird is less easily undermined. Anyone who reports a sighting has to take a lot of stick. I'm a writer, and I'm a writer of non-fiction. I don't go, I'm not a person for practical jokes or anything like that. Seven miles to the northeast of Falmouth is the village of Port Scatho. In July 1985, Sheila Bird and her brother, an environmental scientist, were walking along the clifftop above the village when her brother spotted something out to sea. Sheila, what's that? Good heavens. Whatever is it? There was this uh, gigantic sea creature with a small head, a long neck, and an enormous hump. It's a, it's a monstrous thing. The very first thought that entered my head is, my God, it's escaped from the pages of a storybook. It's a sort of mottled grey. I would say it was swan-like, it was gliding. The shape and appearance was totally different from anything that we are familiar with. 
some months after the sighting, I consulted two paleontologists. I only had to say a few words and they both said to me, you don't have to say any more, we know exactly what you've seen. These are the descendants of the plesiosaur, which were thought to have been extinct millions of years ago. This theory is seen by some zoologists as the only credible explanation for the existence of such creatures. It's not an identical fit, but you wouldn't expect it to be. If it was identical, I'd have great suspicion. Whatever this creature is, if it is a plesiosaur, it has 64 million years of evolution working upon it. The sea is probably less well known than some of the planets in outer space. One man who knows the sea better than most is George Vinicum. He's been a fisherman off the Cornish coast for over 40 years. In July 1976, George set off from Falmouth for a day's fishing with a friend, John Cock. Beautiful day, clear, flat calm, nothing on the water. Just a clear, beautiful morning. Two hours out at sea, George noticed something in the water. John! Come here, quick! I think a boat's capsized. Look over there! What do you reckon? Yeah, it could be a boat. Get closer. I suppose we're about half a mile or more off of this thing at the time. Steam towards it. We could see it was no boat. The devil is it? You know, it didn't come roaring and her jaws open or nothing like that. The old boy was quite content to look at us as we was looking at him. We've seen whales and we've seen dolphins and all that sort of thing, but this was nothing like that at all. This was, well, it looked like a prehistoric monster. And there was no doubt about it, it was something different to what I've ever seen before, and larger than ever I've seen before. We had a 32 foot boat and it was a piece of boat. The two men returned to Falmouth, reluctant to talk about their extraordinary encounter. But word of their sighting of a strange sea creature soon got out. A couple of days after, the local paper came down and interviewed us and asked us what we saw. That started the old bull rolling. Soon afterwards, George Vinicom had a visitor from London. Mr. Vinicom? A gentleman from the Natural History Museum rang me up and said he was coming down to interview me. The creature's neck was, um, how long would you say? Oh, about five, six feet, I'd say. And the body, what size was that? Some Twenty feet at least. Are you sure about that? Sure as I am of anything. Do you think you could draw it for me? Mm. In another room was John Cock. He also drew what he'd seen. Yeah. He drew his. When he brought his back, he said, well, it was the same, you've drawn it before. He said, we haven't drawn it before at all. That's what we saw. And then he brought out this book with all these things in there, prehistoric monsters and all the other. He said, pick out the one you think you saw. That's it, definitely, no doubt about it. Well, what is it? It's a plesiosaur. It's been extinct for over 60 million years. You can't possibly have seen one of those. That is what I saw. Same head, same neck, same body. I think what you saw was a leatherback turtle. I'm telling you, that was no turtle. Now, I have sailed in waters for 40 years, and I have seen turtles and whales and giant squid, but this creature were nothing like I've ever clapped eyes on. I said, you come all the way down from London to tell me what we saw. I said, I'm, I'm telling you what we saw. For Dr. Carl Schuker, the most credible explanation remains the plesiosaur. I don't think that it can be explained away by otters, by the, the traditional explanations. Radical or not, the, the best fit uh, in relation to animals that we know existed at one time or another in the history of our planet, the best fit is the plesiosaur. 
But critics say if plesiosaurs do exist in Cornish waters, you'd expect to find their corpses washed up on the beaches. Dr. Schuker has an explanation for why no carcasses have ever been found. Plesiosaurs are well known for swallowing stones. They did this for buoyancy purposes. So needless to say, a large animal that has quite a, a fair few heavy stones inside it, when it dies, it's going to do one thing, and that's sink. Most experts believe that the sightings alone cannot prove plesiosaurs have survived to the present day. But for the witnesses, the evidence of their own eyes is proof enough. What we've seen, we, we've definitely seen. And what it was, I don't know. If the story of the Loch Ness Monster is anything to go by, the mystery of Morgwa will not go away. But anyone who tries to find the creature will have to search a much larger area than a loch. Morgwa, it seems, could be roaming thousands of square miles of ocean. Cornwall is also the setting for the work of a man officially registered by the Church of England to carry out exorcisms. We'll be featuring him in our second story tonight. In the Middle Ages, the spirit world was part of everyday experience. Today, the church prefers to deal in the spiritual rather than with actual spirits. But when parishioners feel themselves haunted by a presence and modern methods are not appropriate, the church has one ancient remedy it can still call its own, exorcism. Tonight, we tell the story of a vicar who is on a special list of clergymen chosen by the Church of England to carry out this unusual work. The Reverend Robert Law has been on the official list for more than a quarter of a century, but he can still remember the first case he came across. When I was a curate in Bedfordshire, we had a break in to the parish church. And I had to call in the diocesan exorcist, who was a monk at Ashton, Dom Robert Petitpierre. And when he came to reconsecrate the church, he said to me, you could have done this. And I said, yes, but I wouldn't do it without training. He said, well, I'll train you. After four years' instruction, the Reverend Law has carried out deliverances in houses, pubs, even disused tin mines, where hauntings have been reported. Where there is a haunting, it appears that a person, for whatever reason, is not at rest, is not at peace, and through our prayers, we are able to show them a way through to peace. People uh, out for a walk, rambling, saw what they thought was a person standing there. They turned round and then they weren't. These would be reported. Eventually, a picture built up and they called us in to, to deal with them. Usually, it's been a man with a hood with something going on over the, the neck, like a, a helmet. The mine would collapse the person would be buried, there was no point getting them out again. And so, it was a shout for help from them. Life was snapped out all of a sudden. The body is dead, the body is gone, but the spirit was still around. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you send your holy angels to those who are not at peace here. Lift them before the throne of grace, and in your mercy grant them your peace, your joy, your light and refreshment. And the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. The Reverend Law is vicar of the small Cornish town of St. Colum Major. He's called on to deal with hauntings as far afield as Goran, some 30 miles to the south. We have had a number of calls from Goran, and the first one was from the Barley Chief, when Andy Thompson, the landlord, called us in. In the back bar, we would notice a very, very strong smell of pipe tobacco. This would actually occur at a time during the day when there wasn't anybody, any customers in or anything like that. And the fact that I don't smoke a pipe, none of my staff do. Then one of the regulars, Dennis Young, reported something disturbing. This uh, gentleman went out uh, to the toilet block, which is at the back of the pub, and was gone for quite a few minutes, and when he came in, he was visibly shaken. 
and they asked what had happened and he said that he was pinned up against the wall and couldn't move. My daughter said that she'd seen a face of a man looking over her bed. First we thought this was uh, the imagination of her child, then started happening on quite a regular basis. This was one of the things that prompted him to call the parish priest in who got me to come over and sort the thing out. One of the things for a haunting is that there's a drop in temperature. Now, there are many things that can cause that. There's not any springs under there or well under there, is there? Not to my knowledge, no. No. Because sometimes, you know, if the damp's coming up, That's it'll right. make the whole place go yes, cold. Yeah. You've got to check those things out first. No, there isn't anything like that under there. If I show you uh, into the back bar, Once we'd been all the way round, it was obvious that it was centred upon the pool table and the pool room because that's where it was cold and so we celebrated Hokumin on the pool table. After um, Reverend Law's visit, and it was much warmer in the back bar. My daughter never complained of seeing anything and everything seemed much happier. But that wasn't the Reverend's last visit to Goran. He was called in to help Verity and Paul Roscorla at their cottage next door to the pub. It all started with the light switches going on and off, but the children couldn't reach the light switch as they were too small. And even though it's a very old cottage, the wiring's all been completely redone. I'd offered to make a cup of tea for my husband, put the kettle on, and I heard the footsteps come up behind me, and I turned around to speak to Paul, but he wasn't there. So I eventually walked back up to the dining room where I'd left him, and he was still sat there reading the magazine. It was quite scary. But there was a certain stretch of the corridor which was always really cold. It didn't feel right at all. You got down to the kitchen and it was quite mild again. Another strange thing was that uh, we heard humming and singing on a number of occasions. We've got an old piano, uh, neither of us can play, and it's a quite, quite a funny thing, we sort of plink away. And I said to Paul, I said, I'm sure I can hear somebody humming. We thought it could have been the neighbours, but when we asked, they said, no, no, it wasn't us. And it just couldn't have come from anywhere else. The couple also noticed some strange behaviour in their young son, Tristan. The next thing with Tristan was that he would end up being in the front room saying there was a little boy shouting at him and hitting him. I was shocked. I didn't know what to make of it. He said, yes, he's here. He's hitting me. Go away. I don't like you. And he started waving his arms around. And it was then that we decided there was something. There was one specific place in the cottage next door, the corridor, which was very, very cold. The doors were open, if I remember rightly, both ends, so there was a throughput of air, but it was still cold. Bless, O oh Lord, this place, and drive far from us all the snares of the evil one. Let your holy angels dwell here to keep us in peace. In we were a little sceptical, must admit, and although we do go to church occasionally, we're not overtly religious. Once we had blessed that particular corridor, within minutes it warmed up. After the Reverend Law had been, it was so much different. The lights had stopped, the footsteps stopped, the humming stopped. I don't know, it, it was just so warm and, and mild. It, the, the, the whole house, it felt peaceful, it was quiet again. The vicar was asked to help Michael Salt and his mother Sue, also in the Goran area, after they reported a series of strange happenings. I woke up one night and there was a loud scratching just above my head and then the scratching stopped and somebody tried to take the duvet off and then when I pulled it back they tried then to tuck the pillow away from under my head. I thought I dreamt it in the morning but then it happened at intervals regularly after that and I was also too frightened to open my eyes and see if there was anybody there. His presence was a lot stronger than with me and he used to move move things around and so one day we just decided to do the experiment. There are ones which are absolutely filthy, Michael and my pairs. Which was lining up the shoes on the floor in a certain pattern. 
would go back in and the shoes would be in a completely different order. But the desert boots were over here, the, the feeler were at that end, end look, and the, the converts were next to there. They were, they were all and over the beach, like... he's definitely done it. There's no way that there could have been anything in the room because the window was closed. And, you know, we'd, we'd checked the room before and the door was closed. Well, at least you've seen it now. One night, in, in the middle of the night, I was woken by a disturbance or, or something and I got out of bed to go into the middle bedroom to see what was happening. As I opened the door, the mirror flew from the wall and crashed onto the floor. Um, I knew it couldn't have fallen off accidentally because it, it was a fixture on the wall. Michael, come here, quick! Huh? I thought, well, whatever it is, it's here. The incident prompted the family to call in the Reverend Law, but before he could make an appointment, disaster struck. I was trying to light the fire and then there was a rumble in the chimney and then an explosion. And within five minutes, the house was burning. There was absolutely nothing, nothing I could do. I realised there could have been some connection between the fire and the presence that we had in the house. I moved back into the cottage, but it, it didn't feel right. My son came home again to visit, and the minute he came through the door, he said, he is still here. Will you get Robert Law? There was one particular bedroom. I experienced something which I interpreted as a, a young child, a boy. It's just here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly there. Yeah, it's cold. You can feel it. Just here, cold. Yes. He stopped and said, he's there. There he is. He's there in that corner. I said, well, that is exactly where Michael said he was. That's it. The holy water represents the water of baptism where we are redeemed into Christ, we are freed. Since Michael had been the person who had experienced most of what was going on in the cottage, it seemed right if he wanted to be there, that he should be involved. After Reverend Law had gone that day, it did feel more peaceful and a lot calmer than it had before. Demand for the Reverend Law's special skills now extend well beyond his own parish. He's asked to deal with more than 60 cases a year. The heavy workload means he's had to enrol two more clergymen to relieve him of some of the burden. Around half the complaints can be put down to creaking doors, faulty heating and the like. But for the rest, he has no physical explanation. Good night.